Hi guys, Brett here from Hearns Hobbies and I'm joined by factory team Yokomo driver Matthew Jenkins. G'day everyone. As we talk two-wheel drive off-road. Giddy up. You know? Yeah, yep. So this car that we've got here is Yokomo's latest offering, it's the SO 1.0. Yep. And this is actually set up for stock racing. Correct. This is set up for young Noah Jenkins. Mm -hmm. And this car. is his weapon of choice. So we thought that we'd like to take the time to well, Matt's going to talk about the car, some setup tips, and some tire, some tire, some tire tutorials, yep. and tutorial, um, and talk about the setup and the handling and the characteristics of a two-wheel drive buggy. So, where do we start, Matt? All right. Well, probably one of the key things to start at would be to take the lid off. Yep. Let's have a look inside. And we've got a fine-looking lid too. Yeah, hey? yeah. Not too bad. She's had a few knocks. Yeah, but that's off-road, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, Matt's yeah. also, you might have seen some of our other our other videos. We actually did some a very similar scheme to this in the studio, didn't we? That's the right. orange and the chrome. Yeah. That yeah. was on a TC body. Correct. But yeah, the polycarbonate shells, they are sort of a disposable item somewhat. Yep. So, um, so obviously, the first thing you'll see here is um, a lot of electrical inside the vehicle. Yep. So, everything from, uh, we've got our Orca control motor, so 17.5 turn stock motor which is in fact the stock motor isn't it i'm Correct. just getting the focus right here looking at it right here got my magical pointer we've got the blitzring 2 17.5 and that is for two-wheel drive stock 17.5 is what we race here in victoria australia wide and internationally in most yep. cases um it is an open motor as far as it's not fixed timing correct um and this one here i can see it's had some tuning work this is from uh dr defina's stables sure. isn't it yes so um, as long as it's raw approved and got all the original parts, it is fantastic little stock motor, mm -hmm. and they actually provide really good power. It's actually uh, we ran this in Mildura, yep, and it, it's a strong little motor, yes, for yep. sure. Um, and then moving forward here, fifty four ninety, fifty four ninety battery. Yep, again, that's the Orca Infinite X series. Um, awesome power, great power band through the, the entire range of racing too. So yep. the five minutes racing. Um, doesn't drop off, so yeah. Look, um, Noah seems to be able to put out his consistent laps quite easily with with that amount of power. All the way until the very end, huh? Mm, mm, that's well, I right. suppose you're going to get motor fade somewhat before the battery fade. Right. Yeah, they're only five minute races in off road. Yeah, um, and really they don't have a huge power consumption compared to on road. No, that's right. You know, because yep. they simply, especially tour drive, simply doesn't have doesn't the have the mechanical grip. Yeah, that's right. But that's, um, the, that's the, the challenge with two-wheel drive off-road, isn't it? Trying and that's to create the beauty. That, yeah, yeah and it's really, really grip. rewarding to, to feel the car struggling and, and feed the, the traction and the power into it Correct. to get the car to, to move how you want it to. That's right. Um, so this here, that is an ESC, and that looks more like a receiver that we it's used to use five years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Have a look weapon. at the size of it. The totem, yeah. That is the latest uh, stock spec speed controller from Orca, and that is the totem. I've yep. um, been really, really popular in both off-road and on-road. Mm -hmm. um, we can't sell and we can't keep them off of them for very good reason. They're mm. just super popular, fully mm. raw approved, reverse polarity protected, built-in capacitors. Yeah, it's honestly the footprint's tiny, um, and a, what a fantastic little speedy. Yep, really easy to set up mm -hmm. um, and full program box compatible Correct. as well. So yes. you one program box pretty much across the whole Orca range. Yes, and you can set up your throttle values your punch settings your yep. pulse width modulation correct yeah frequencies and so on frequencies brake timing. Yeah. Uh, yeah so brake frequencies brake frequencies yep. um unlike the other stock spec speedies that orca have made you can't turn this one to open mode can no, you no no it's no. A purely a stock stock speedy yeah so it cannot go anything other than blinky and and one of the good things here is that um if you're just a stock racer you're yep. not buying something that's not that's unnecessary so yeah. it's price point it's, it's unbelievable for the for the product that you're getting what's well, about in all seriousness it's less than a half price of the full works um oe1 world spec edition correct speed controller yeah um it does only handle a third of the current but a 17.5 or 13.5 you don't that's need said, it if you're a stock racer that's right. this is a absolute bargain yep and then we're moving over here this red item here what's that nice little transponder there that counts Noah's laps um so yeah plugs into the receiver powers up and goes over the um, timing loop yep and provides all the timing information back to the computer so we know that's right and the performing. timing loop is an electronic cable that's run yep. usually under the track surface yep. in some cases um some over, cases over. That's right. like a little bridge yep. but yeah run under the track surface and this emits a little frequency and it picks up all Correct. digitally and decoded by the computer and the system 
which is really, really good. And a lot of clubs have their, what we call live timing, operational 24 hours a day. Yep. So you can turn up and practice and try things. Um, provided, I think provided you're a member of that yeah, club. Yeah, of most clubs, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll get your timing information either on your phone or, or read out while you're running. That's right. Um, over here we've got a little receiver. Yep. And that's where your speed controller um, and your transponder, servo. your servo and your fan are plugged into. Yep. That takes the radio signals from your transmitter in your hand. Yep. And this is one of the it. antennaless versions. Yep. A nice little sandway unit by the looks of it. Yep. And then up further we've got a highest BLP 700 which is their second from the top correct um servo fully digital um nice alloy case presents really well and it's more Robust. than more than got the the specs and capability to run two-wheel drive or yes. four-wheel drive off-road yeah. and road. really really robust this these servos have been fantastic no i hasn't been able to destroy one which yep. is, in my books has been uh fantastic so well um, reliability is a big yeah. part of the thing these off-road cars they do take a lot of rough and tumble yep Compared to the on-road cars that we race, correct, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and obviously your steering throw, you're, you're a lot more vulnerable, right? So you've got these open-wheeled yes. vehicles, right, with arms and those sorts of things sticking out. So that servo in an in an incident um, could take a real beating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, constantly under sort of jittery force and, and knocks, and if I'm behind the wheel, be cartwheeling across the infield. <laughs> so that is fantastic. So mm. I suppose what's some so the car's got a battery and motor and stuff in it. I suppose what some of the other things before you would hit the track, some basic sort of, I suppose, setup procedures or checkovers that you would have to ensure that you're getting a nice, straight, clean running car. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, well, first thing um, is to check, um, depending on what type of surface you're running on, whether it's yes. a loose surface or, 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 a, or, a, or a more slick surface with more grip. Um, what we'll do today, I think this is, as you can see, we've got a pin tire yes. on this at the moment. So I'm trying to get rid of that glare, mate. Okay. Which is not going to work out for me. Anyway, we'll go with this, mate. We'll go with that, mate. That'll now. do. Yeah. All right, so yeah, tire choice is a big thing when yes. you're going to a track. So I think that one of the bigger things you can do correctly is select the right tire for the conditions that you're going to. And off-road cars, I mean, all of our RC racing is really how fast you can go is really how much traction or grip Correct. you can Correct. generate yep. or get out of your chassis and car. The more grip you've got, the faster you can go. Yep. And this is also paramount in off-road. Correct. Because it's a considerably, in most cases, a low traction compared to running on like asphalt. That's right. It's a dirt surface. Yep. And depending on the weather, um, yep. determines oh, how much traction you can get when you get there. Yep. All right. So there's never a, a, a dull moment with off-road. Um, the track changes all the time. And yes. depending on how much traffic's been on it. But but turning up to a track, if you know that it's uh, watered red clay, yep. um, not oiled, so if it's a watered red clay type surface, you know you're going to turn up with a pin tire. Yep. All right. So that might be a uh, sweep square armor. Yep. Type type of product so this is a really faithful offering from sweep and this is one of our, our biggest seller here at Hearns is the sweep square armor and that comes in both uh, buggy rear and four-wheel drive front which is slightly narrower um, and this will generally get used in conjunction on a two-wheel drive with a rib style tire and you can see it's a rib style tire because of the yep. ribs yeah, the ribs you know it's called a tri rib called a tri-rib and not only um so we're pretty consistent with the tread so we won't change the the tread on the front of a two-wheel drive very often if we're using a pin tire we Correct. will however change the compound Correct. that's right um and the compound of the rubber is no different from the full size racing cars where we refer to as softer and harder compounds yep. Yep. um so that is fundamentally a pin tire so that is for like you said clay loose or watered tracks Correct. that's right yeah yep so that's one uh one thing to think about when you go into that type of surface and then if you're going to a, a an oil type surface yep um there's a different type of tire like a web or a bar type tire yep that you'd use for um for those conditions yep um so realistically in the sweep range um we've got you covered as far as the two different styles of track that are available to us in victoria at the yes. moment all right. Yes. Um, there are other tyres from Sweep which are used for Astro. Yes. Which may come in handy at some point. Yep. Um, but for the for the tracks that we've got at the moment, um, certainly the the pin tyre or yep. a web web or bar type tyre. And this uh, is the called, go to. This one here in particular is called the Sweep Orbit. Isn't Orbit. It? Yep. 
So that's really, really cool. It's a fairly new addition to the range. Yes. Um, sort of designed and engineered for Australian conditions somewhat. Um, so that's constantly evolving with Hearn's relationship with Sweep and the factory. So that's really cool. And look, early indications on this tyre have been fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So these have really just hit the market in the last month or so. Yep. Um, and we'll get them on the track a bit more now that the hopefully the weather stays stays fine. Absolutely. And when you're running a tyre of the web or the bar style, you'll mm -hmm. generally have something similar on the front. Correct. So you won't have a rib tyre no, on the front. definitely not. I won't have the amount of grip that you're no. looking for in those conditions. No. no, so you'd run something of a similar pattern on the front. Yep. Like you'd run a tendroid on the yep. front quite easily. Uh, sweep tendroid on the or front. An or an orbit. By the time this video comes out, we'll have hot, hot off the press orbits on tipping. Yep, I'd say so. So there'll be an orbit front tyre that will match as well. Yep. Um, and get you hooked up. So we'll probably talk about inserts shortly. Yep. Um, but we'll go back to the car, I think. Go back to the car. And so loose track, pin tyre. Yep clay oiled hard pack track we've got the That's bar right. or web tire correct okay so back car, to the car is back mate all right so um uh, try and keep tight when you're when you're learning buggies try and keep tires simple yes um have a bar tire or a web tire and have a pin tire have a couple of different compounds but don't make it more complicated than that no all right no, so it's easy to get lost and constantly chasing the track correct when essentially you've got to address either the car or your driving to suit the Correct. conditions on hand. But tyre would equate to, what do you think, 80% of your setup? I'd say a good... Or, or opportunity uh, for traction. Yeah, absolutely. All right, absolutely. so um, the tyre the choice is probably the larger fundamental. Yes. Um, and, and generally speaking, when you go to the track, you can actually ask around, especially if you're a newcomer. There's plenty of friendly folks at all of the tracks. Absolutely. Um, and they can give you some advice on what type of tyre you could use. Yes. Um, they usually have a Facebook or a, a, a user group that you, Absolutely. Can, you can jump on and get some information about the, the local tyre or yeah. the local uh, type or style at least. That's right. And, and you it's can make those constantly decisions. evolving. There's yeah. a few brands in the market, JC, Proline, yep. Sweep, definitely. Yep. They all offer similar products, but they're all uniquely different. Correct. Yep. yep. So then you'd probably go about thinking about some other things uh, such as ride height. That is the fundamental thing, isn't it, with yeah. your car and right. ride height. So in order for a car to get traction, particularly on a loose surface, you need it to pivot and yes. shift. So um, the, the movement of weight under acceleration or under braking or under steering or turning is actually one of the fundamentals to generating grip at that moment. All right, and maintaining momentum. Yes. So that's a it's a fundamental to um, to trying to get around the track as fast as you can. Absolutely, right. absolutely. It is. So um, on a on a loose surface, if, again, if you're using a pin tire, normally your ride heights are a little bit higher than on a slick surface. Yes. That's oil, right? So and that's again to create that opportunity for the car to have more of a pivoting motion. Yes. Um, and to generate grip on that outside wheel where all the weight's being pushed. Yes. All right, so got a nice little camber gauge, uh, uh, ride height gauge there. Yeah, and something to do, something to help us get our baseline figures would be a ride height gauge, much like the one I've got in my hand. Now this is an offering from HB, um, and it's an undercar unit, and you can see here it can in fact go from fifth, uh, sorry, from fifteen mil all the way up to forty-five mil. So we'll do tenth scale buggy all the way up to eighth scale truggy. Um, so this is a really handy tool and it's the sort of thing that you'll just buy like once in your life and you look after it and you will hold on to it. Yep. So a good ride height gauge and what we'll do there is we'll measure under the chassis. Now everybody's going to have a, their slightly own way of measuring ride height. The main thing is you do it consistently on your car so you know where you're measuring it and you know what your settings are. So this car is effectively ready to go albeit just missing a body. But that's typically how we would set the ride height. Yep. So show us what, what numbers are we looking at with the pin tires. It's obviously been on a loose track. Yep, correct. So this has come straight from Algeria, the way yep. it is at the moment. So one of the things to to, to do is to, to try and simulate the ride height of the car in its movements. Yes. All right. So a lot of the people tend to push the car down or push the buggy down like yep. this to, to, to get the car to settle. Um, I've seen others drop the car down yep. on the ground like this or on the, the setup board like this because actually this is going to settle the car further than that under gravity yeah right so it, neither of them's wrong no provided you when you do your measurements you do them the same way all right so if you measure like this 
keep measuring like this. Yep. Right. If you measure like this, keep measuring like this. That's right. Yeah. So first thing to do on a loose track, um, I'd suggest starting at around 22 or 23 millimeters yep. of ride height. Now on a loose track, we found that the ride height for the front was better at one mil higher than the rear in order to get rear traction on launch and to get the car to pivot, depending on your droop, your rear droop, yep. but we'll get to that shortly, um, that the car seemed to be more stable uh, high speed wise. Yes. Um, on a loose track with a slightly higher ride height at the front. So let's just move this to 24 mil for the front. 24 mil. Now I do like to measure my ride height like yep. that. Yep. So normally you wouldn't be on a flexible surface like this. No. You'd be on something a little bit harder. Something a bit harder, but, but we're getting a bit of glare. But this is what we've got. So again, consistent. So we're a little bit higher. A little bit higher, and then you would just back just off the, shock the collars. back off the shock collars a little bit. Again, same motion. There we go. Spot on. So that's 24 happy mil. With that? Yep, 24 mil at the front. Yep. And let's go to 23 at the rear. So if you look on the, the overhead. So I haven't set a car with a higher front ride height for, for Noah, a while. Yeah, for, for Noah. For a while. Yeah, for Noah it worked better. And so that's the thing with setup. Sometimes you just get stuck into doing things because that's what you've always done. Correct. And sometimes it's good to think outside the box. Yeah. And just try little things. And ride height is my favourite thing to play with because it's the simplest thing to change. And I'm pretty lazy at the track. So ride height is a really good tuning tool. Yeah, I think we're at the drive and go stage, aren't we? Right. <laughs> ride height and springs are my favourite. Or yep. upper shock position are my favourite things to tune on the car. Yep. Okay, we should be nearly there. There we go. Look at that. Right on. And you can just hear that. It's just ever so slightly tapping on the chassis yep and if you do that consistently at least you'll know you'll have a baseline setup yep so that's actually one of the easier things to um, either get right or really wrong yes all right so if you've got a, a rule of thumb on a loose track a higher ride height around 23 22 yep 24 mil, that, that seems to be the area of oh, setup window for most of the yep. cars um, on a slick track uh, for two-wheel drive you might go to 21 or 20 mil and that is to aid, I suppose, you want to almost take away a little bit of traction yep. and prevent traction rolling. Correct. And yeah, and, so the, and try and induce some more stability. Yeah, so that also creates a, an opportunity where there's less roll. Yep. All right, so less less uh, movement of the center of gravity of the car over the tire. Yes. Yeah. So there, that's right height. Um, and show us another tuning thing. I reckon camber would have to be another one. Key player. A really big key player and this is really for not only for tuning and driving but also for making sure your car goes straight and square if you've had a bingle it's a quick thing to go out of adjustment Correct. yep um, and you can not notice that until you actually start circulating again after a big accident you haven't checked that you put your car out and it'll be trying to accelerate to one side or it'll be hooking It'll be oversteering one yeah, or another way steering, yeah. compared to the other way. Um, and then you'll see your car go down the straight away from you and then the wheel will be like it cocked in. That's right. You know, because yeah. you haven't been paying attention. So camber, and that is the inclination of the wheels from the vertical axis. At ride height. At ride height. Correct. So camber is, so 90 degrees to the, the ground, that would be zero degree Correct. camber. Yep. When we talk about minus camber, that is the top of the, the tire pointing towards the center line. Which is 99% of the cases, the way you go. Yeah. Yep. And that's so when the car is leaning, it pushes the tire straight. Correct. Instead of over rotating it, and then you've got positive camber, which wouldn't be ideal because you'll be more inclined to traction roll or catch the rim on ruts and that Correct. sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay, and to do camber, I've got, this is what I use at the track. And this is a very simple Aramax camber gauge. And it does have, we'll get in close. So this little tool here does have uh, one degree, two degree, and three degree measurements on it. Um, depends on how you stand it up in relation to the wheel. So it's a nice little tool. Um, and I find it plenty good enough for what I want to do. Um, you can go half a degree increments, but I'm not a half a degree driver in all honesty. So. <laughs> no, you're full on. That's right. So, and to do that, you can either use, um, some people will have a dedicated set of wheels 
for the application. You so you'll right. always set your ride height first, like Matt's done, because yep. you'll always want to check it at ride height. And then it's as simple as standing it up to the tire over the over the center point of the axle. So you could probably do it that way if you wanted to. Yep. So we can do it on the, on the camera here and something like that. Now a big factor, especially with off-road cars, if it's a buckled or a poorly glued tire, that can create problems. No, I'm just saying. I heard you're having a go at my gluing. No, definitely right. not. I would definitely, if it's my wheels, I'll definitely give it a couple of goes and take a mean average. <laughs> you know, because my wheels are the ones, especially in the front of my four-wheel drive, they've probably got about five degrees of run out. Okay. Um, and look, it depends on the position of the insert in the wheel and those sorts of things as well. So you can get little bulb areas, bulbous areas on the tire if you're not careful. Yeah. So take a couple of measurements, don't just take one. That's right. And just a simple little rotation. That's right. That's right. Um, and then I can see here that Noah's got a nice healthy two degrees. It's pretty much spot on two degrees. I don't know what setup you were chasing. Two degrees. And you want to check left and right. Um, and that makes sure that we're going right. Now, why would you change rear camber? Um, depending on the track conditions. Yeah. Um, less or more side bite as you're going into a turn. Yep. So um, you can either tune it in or tune it out. Yep. All right. so and forward traction somewhat. Somewhat, yeah. And look, that, that's really dependent on the camber link position and how it squats yep. and how square the tyre stays, right? So you can actually determine how much forward traction you get with that, that set up too. Yeah. Generally, on a really bumpy track, um, I'll probably induce a little bit more camber just to save the tyre, the wheel, the outer rim catching on oh, right. bumps yeah. and ruts. In my, in my case, usually the concrete curbs that I'm bouncing off. One of the really good features about this camera gauge yep. though, is that it's got this cutout. Yes. So it actually clears the wheel nut. Yes. So that's a really cool little yep. feature. That's actually an eight scale tool. Yep. Um, and I use it on a 10 scale as well. Yeah. So it's really good. It doesn't go out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, and if it does, then it's the least of my worries. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and again, you'll do the same thing with the front end. The front, that's right. Pretty simple. So we've got two degrees there. We should be around two degrees at the front there. Oh no, we're probably closer to one. And you probably want to do that with the radio on because the cars have so much caster, mm. which is a different force again. It does change the camber dramatically. Yeah. So again, that's a whole other topic of caster and kick up. Yeah. So also your ride height determines how much um, camber you're having as well. So obviously the further the arm travels down, you can see the more uh, negative camber you're getting. Yeah, so it's pulled in a bit at right. the top. And that's why it's really important to measure the car's values at ride height. Yeah, and do it consistently. Correct. So you can go back and adjust your car for your settings. Yep. There's no point going off somebody else's settings per se, because they might do theirs a little bit differently. Hmm. Okay, so that is pretty much the basis of the geometry and getting your two-wheel going. Correct. Now let's discuss tyres a little bit more. Tyres. Okay, now we did discuss bar tires, web tires, and pin tires. Now, another critical thing is inserts. the inserts. Now, the inserts in the tires act like air pressure. Correct. So, and if you've ever driven a, a full-size car with 10 PSI in the tires, compared to 40 PSI, she feels a bit squirmy. there is a huge difference, um, you know, and it's no different with our radio control cars. In fact, that's probably one of the, the easiest ways to visualize what something's going to do on one of these cars, is if you've got experience driving a vehicle, is to understand what it's like to drive on half inflated tires. Yep. Or fully inflated tires. Yeah. Or jump across a medium strip and like see how you go for the ride height. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a buckled wheel thereafter, right? <laughs> so yeah, inserts are, are probably um, another very, very important factor in getting your tire to work. Yes. All right. So um, on a on a bar or a web tire, it would be very unlikely to use a open cell insert. Yes, because you generally use this open cell insert on a really low traction correct. track, correct. which wouldn't be conducive to a bar or web tire. Right. That's right. So a loose and low traction track is where you'd be using a pin tire. Yes. And more likely to use an open cell insert. Correct. So I'm just going to use that comparison because we used it before. This is effectively like having 10 psi in your tires. Correct. This one here is effectively like having 40. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's why on a higher traction track, we will have much higher um, tire pressure to aid in the stability 
of that oh, the, and the handling of the tread pattern you want to keep it as flat as possible that's right yep as well as the the deformation or the ballooning of the Correct. tire particularly in your high powered and we refer to it as modified or open motored cars mm. the open cell insert the foam here can really distort and blow the tire out yep. to about four times the size which narrows the contact patch to probably just that center bar there and that creates a lot of uh, instability at high speed yeah which is exactly what you don't want uh, it's my favorite thing <laughs> i thrive in that zone instability at high speed that's where i'd start to come alive mm. <laughs> mentally no, and i was physically. going to say oh, i was just going to leave that alone <laughs> so um so a low traction so like i said a bar or web tire we traditionally won't put a open cell insert into no um but definitely a pin tire you'll definitely it's really really good to have the same tire the same compound and correct. the same pin glued up with open cell and closed cell insert correct because in the morning when the track's like fluffy or a bit loose mm -hmm. yeah this this could be the absolute ultimate correct. but as it dries up or gets dusty and rutted or really bumpy yep. you'll need that extra stability and control of the closed cell insert That's right. And look, there is a driving style you do need to change when you go from uh, closed cell to open cell. Yep. Um, with an open cell insert, because the tire collapses a little more in turns, yep. um, you do need a little bit more of a point and shoot style of driving where you're not carrying quite as much speed through a turn, Yep. which is what the extra tire pressure, like you said, yep. gives you the ability to do provided the track's in the right condition. Yes. Right, so th there is some little, uh, th there's certainly some trial and error um, if the track's rutted out, I wouldn't recommend that you go to an open cell insert. No. Try and find traction another way. Because the problem that you'll face there is the wheel, the rim collapsing and catching on the Correct. edge. Yeah. Um, you know, so what it does, it literally just the, the sharpness of the track. I can feel this one here's got a closed cell insert. Um, the, the firmness of the track and the rut catches on the plastic and creates all sorts of inconsistencies in yep. the car. It will be you'll be trying to track around the corner. It'll be jerking, and carrying on, and yep. or it and might just let go too. Like it might hit a rut and just let go. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's really good to have this feel. And generally, the the faster you're going, the more air pressure you'll be Correct. running. Correct. So if you're starting off or junior with a seventeen point five at a loose track, an open cell insert. Or even a vintage car. Yep. An open cell insert is really nice and forgiving. Correct. Um, and a good way to well, uh, get consistent. In vintage, an open cell actually compensates for a lot of the inability and suspension. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So. And they're usually vastly, vastly underweight, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. So um, in in vintage, I'll always say at Knox, I'll always run an open cell insert yep. in a square armor tire. Um, whereas uh, and, and vintage, you've got to run pin. Have to run pin, yeah. yeah. No matter what track you're going yep. to, uh, it's it's not. I think it's an unwritten rule, but it's, it's part of that keeping, gentlemanly. It's in keeping with the vintage period, bash. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. vintage bash. Yeah. So um, you have to run a pin tire, but at a uh, track like Keylor, yep. I'll run the same tire, perhaps a different compound, but with a closed cell insert. Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so I think we've talked the buggy. We've had an overview of. The electronics we've talked a bit of setup and i think we're ready to hit the track what do you reckon almost 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 one more but thing wait there's more there is a little bit more oh one of the things to think about that's a really really simple um setup trick um to try and get more traction on loose or mm -hmm. or, or grippy surfaces is your battery position battery position really really easy to change really easy to experiment with and uh weight distribution is something that you have i think you should learn as early as you can um, because it can actually generate a lot more grip or a lot less grip depending on which direction you, you're trying to get that um, into that position for. Yes. So on a loose track, normally the battery goes all the way back. Yes. Normally. On a very high grip surface, the battery goes further forward. So these are the, they're probably two uh, uh, fundamental tracks to think about and your battery position as to how the car performs from a balanced point of view from front to rear. So what you want is a car that can provide enough grip to physically go forwards and then continue to steer through a corner without being overpowered by the rear end of the car on a high grip track and yes. vice versa for a low grip track. You don't want the battery too far forward on a low grip track because you'll overcome, uh, you'll overcompensate at the front because you haven't got enough rear grip. So weight distribution is another really, really simple trick to learn about. 
And I suppose that every time you change your battery position, you would then have to reset your right height. Reset all of it. That's correct. Yeah, reset yeah. your right height back to those numbers because you don't want to be altering two things at once. Correct. One thing at a time. Because if yeah. you move that battery forward by three or four mil, which is probably the next step, all of a sudden you're going to have more weight on the correct. front. And if you don't check your ride height, you'll probably drop one or two mil mm. and the back will come up and then the whole balance of the car is going to be completely different to yeah. what you had before. And that's really not a good gauge on that one step from your setup before. Yeah. All right. Because not only have you changed the battery position, but if you haven't checked your ride height and it is different, realistically, you've changed your ride height too. Your ride height and your camber. And your camber. So that's why we always check, well, I always check ride height first before doing anything. Mm. Um, and yeah, so if you're making these changes, just be very aware and just try and make one change at a time. You can go as far as notating. And this is the thing I get back to about the transponders and the live timing. When you're under race conditions, it's hard, especially mm. if you're not on track for only every hour and a half because the track right. itself can change. That's right. But when you're at the track on a Saturday afternoon and you're smashing batteries, you might just do three minutes, quickly come back in, move the battery forward, go out and do another three Correct. minutes. You will be able to see that on your live timing, That's right. exactly how you're going. Yep. And you'll be pleasant, well, pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised. Correct, and, but it gives you a direction. You'll have a direction, it'll yep. start to map out. And if you notice something that hasn't changed or hasn't made you go faster, make sure you go back. Because if you change that, and then next step you do something else, and then all of a sudden your car or your buggy is far away from where you started the yeah. day, and you don't know what you've done to actually make it go faster or slower. Correct. The other thing to think about is not to worry about a single fastest lap. Right? Yes. What you're looking for is a, an opportunity for, cons for consistent laps. Right Now, when you're learning, those consistent laps will probably be a long way apart. Yes. But as you get better and better, and as you practice more, they'll get closer together. So look at your top three consecutive, look at your top five consecutive, and make sure even those gaps are small, or as small yeah. as possible, and they're getting smaller progressively as you're going through your batteries. And if you are new to a track, it doesn't, well, for me it doesn't matter if you're experienced or if you're just starting out, just go out and put like three batteries through without changing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just go out and learn the track Correct. and be confident, get some muscle memory up, you know, identify bumps and situations. Yeah. Look how the car behaves. That's right. Yeah. You know, there's people that turn up to a brand new track, do three laps, come in, change their car, and they're still learning the track. So by the time that they've done another three or four batteries, the energy that they're putting through their car is a lot differently than it was yeah. three batteries ago. That's right. So just have fun doing it. Yeah, It's absolutely. a great way. It's super challenging. You almost never get it right. No. But... But that's, that's part of the challenge. Bit. Yeah, look, uh, right or wrong, I don't know that it, that comes into it, but uh, I think pleasant. Like the experience has got to yeah, be on the track, right. it's got to be pleasant, right? That's right. So you've got to get to a point where you enjoy your racing, the car's handling in such a way that you can enjoy it. Yep. And make progress on your capability to get closer to the front, if that's what you're wanting to do. Or, um, again, just enjoy it. Fantastic, Matthew. All right, well, I think we'll leave it there. Yep, no problem. That is a lot of information. And that is going buggy racing with Matt Jenkins, Hearns Racing, and Team Yokomo. Absolutely. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks, everyone.